Welcome to The Edges of Lean. I'm Bella Engelbach, and in this podcast, we explore the human and creative side of lean thinking, unusual places where lean thinking is practiced. We meet people who are practicing continuous improvement in many different flavors and styles. So come along with me on a journey to the edges of lean. Episode 15, Continuous Improvement and Nonverbal Communication. As a manager, supervisor, or a continuous improvement facilitator or coach, you know that communication is a key skill for success and improvement. So how are we communicating? We know what we say is important, right? And most of us would acknowledge that how we say it is important too. But think about this. You're still communicating even when you are not physically on the shop floor or in the room or even on the Zoom call. We're going to take a trip to the edges of lean and explore many aspects of nonverbal communication, even the ones that happen when you're not there. My guests are Shelley O'Donovan and Jason Haynes. Shelley O'Donovan is the CEO of the Authentic Influence Group. She teaches persuasive speaking at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. She has led vaccine advocacy for GlaxoSmithKline, worked as a healthcare lobbyist, and served as a staffer in state government. She's been focused on cultivating authentic influence her entire career, and she loves to decode what makes people tick. Shelley has an MPA for the University of Pennsylvania, a marketing certification from the Wharton School, a BA in political science. She has a certification also in body language training and the Big Five personality from a behavioral research lab. Jason Haynes is a lean practitioner who uses standard work to help communication throughout the workplace, to help reduce chaos and frustration amongst frontline workers and between the frontline and leadership. Jason is a managing director with Industrial Solutions based in Arizona, and he has worked in the manufacturing industry for over 20 years. He is a lean Six Sigma black belt. He works with logistics, manufacturing, service companies, and office areas on developing lean processes. Shelley O'Donovan and Jason Haynes, welcome to the Edges of Lean. How are you doing today? Thank you. <laughs> I'm doing great, and it's, it's wonderful to have you both here. Uh, so Jason, let's start with you. Uh, we're talking today about all the ways we communicate that we don't necessarily know that we communicate. And I'd love for you to tell your story. First of all, how did you get involved in what you're doing? Uh, and then we'll move on from there. So a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm Jason Haynes from Industrial Solutions. Uh, we uh, were a consulting firm that helps companies with their lean management practices and everything as far as going in, taking a look at everything as far as their processes and, and helping them improve those processes. And how I got into what I'm doing currently is I've, I've got 20 years of manufacturing experience that I just kind of grew to love the manufacturing and industrial era or area within uh, within the, the whole field of, I just got to know a lot of people within the front line and in, in the front office and wanted to help them people to be able to communicate with each other. And when I was growing up, my, my father and my grandfather always told me not to go into manufacturing. And I ended up in manufacturing and grew to love it. And, and that's how I got into lean management and, and uh, being part of the lean, lean infrastructure as far as teaching people how to communicate with each other through not just nonverbal communication, but also how to, to teach other people how to do things so they don't have to, to find a leader to, to make those decisions. They can make the decisions on their own. So you reached out to me actually with this story about standard work. And so could you, can you just uh, start for those people who are listening? I'm, I'm sure a lot of people who are listening know all about standard work, but for those who aren't listening, describe for us what standard work is. 
So standard work is, is uh, visual workplace management. Uh, where front, in my mind, it's where frontline employees have something right there in front of them. So if they get lost within their process, they have a place to come back to, or they can take a, a look at that that standard work to make sure they're on the right track and they're they're uh, at the right pace within the the uh, area that they're working in, and also so they can just easily make those adjustments rather than having to stop their work, the, the uh, supervisor, the leader of that area getting frustrated with them. And then you got two people frustrated at each other. And, and in my mind, that's where a lot of your employee turnover comes from because that communication is not there. So with that standard work, you have something visually easy for those people to come up to. Uh, the funny thing is that the funny story about my first experience with standard work is I wrote an SOP. And I remember I, I was deflated from my manager when I wrote this SOP. He's like, this is too long. Nobody's going to read it. And that's where I started delving into finding out what standard work was, where it's more simplified, has pictures. Because not going to lie, a lot of people do not want to see words or a lot of a lengthy worded process, especially when they're working. So they want those pictures to make it easy and a few words that kind of describes what that picture is saying to them. Yeah, so my experience with, you know, with that kind of documentation is that, so, you know, it's sort of, it is hard to read, or it's put in a place where you can't always find it. So yeah. what, what, what are your, your, your big takeaways about, about that? You want to have it right there, pretty much at, uh, you want to have it in front of the employee, or even in front of the uh, leader within that line. So it's right there in front of them. It makes it easier for them to find. Uh, you don't want to have it in the, the office. Like you, I know you guys have experienced probably with SOPs and stuff. They're usually in the office. They're usually a, about three inches thick and nobody reads them. They got dust on them. And usually the only time they come out is when there, there's a, uh, a quality audit or something coming through your, your uh, facility. And that's the, the big thing with standard work. You want it right there in front of the employee. That way it makes it easier for them to take a look at, just like even uh, tracking boards you want right there in front of the employee. So it's easy for them to, to take a look at and, and it's easy for them to read and, and not have to run and go and find somebody to, to bring that out to them. Yeah, so, so Shelly, I'd love to bring, bring you into this. Um, when we think about communication, you know, we do think a lot about, okay, so what am I saying, right? And particularly if you're the a leader on the shop floor, like, like Jason's talking about, or, or you know, somebody who's the, the, the manager coming through, a supervisor coming through. You think about what you're saying. Um, how much more is there than what we just say? Yeah, so there's a lot more. So we often, uh, if you think even just about the first impression that someone makes, we often think it's, you know, if we go into a meeting that it's the first time we open our mouths and it's not, it's the first time someone sees you. So even if you're headed to a meeting and on the way there, you stop for a cup of coffee at Wawa, um, if somebody spots you in that, you know, fumbling with your coffee or, you know, doing something crazy in that Wawa, that's going to be their first impression of you. So we really have to think about what those nonverbals are saying and how we communicate with our nonverbals. So as well, if you go into a stressful situation and, you know, you have a stressful situation and then you go into the office after that, that could leak out in your nonverbals and someone on the other side of that could think, oh, what, what did I do, right? An employee is there thinking, what did I do that day? Like, what, what could I have done wrong that made the boss so angry? So it's really, it's really easy to have those nonverbals slip out and we don't even think about it because we're so worried on what we're going to say instead of how we're going to say it. And I should explain for, uh, for those folks who are not in the Philadelphia area or in the, in the part of the world where Wawa is the center of the yeah. universe, that Wawa is the place to get coffee in the morning if you um, in the Philadelphia area, which Shelly and I both happen to be. I, yeah. right. I was actually right. going to ask that. I, I didn't know if Wawa was just a, a uh, made up name or if it was an actual area that you guys went to. <laughs> it's a very successful convenience store. <laughs> It's, yeah. So, but that, but that's a great point because, because 
who you are, right? It's not just who you are in the, in the workplace. Right. It's, it's where people see you and, and what you're bringing in with you. And then Jason, I think, you know, when we're thinking about then how do we get that into some sort of written or visual communication? I'm wondering, does that leak over, right? So we're writing something down or we're helping somebody write something down or, we, you know, we're trying to try to give them instructions in, in picture format, perhaps, um, you know, how we're thinking about that. I, I'm wondering, you know, how we think about that um, as, oh. as we're, we're getting it, getting it communicated. Yeah, I'm, I've never even thought of about it that, in that sense, as far as getting it communicated. I know my very first standard work, I, I wasn't a very good with PowerPoint because like I said, I came from working on the floor. So one of those things, you're, you're learning PowerPoint on top of, uh, on top of also trying to write a standard work process or, or a Word document or however you, whatever document you was using in order to make that standard work. Now I've got to the point where I, I understand Excel and PowerPoint and different things. So I know how to, to design that stuff. So yes, my very first one was probably very sloppy. And as, as Shelly was saying, sometimes that, that standard work, when it's sloppy, the employee's going to be kind of sloppy as far as what they're doing. Uh, it's funny that Shelly was talking about the, the, the people seeing you at first and what they understand. I, I talk a lot about my grandfather over the years as, as far as the stuff that he taught me. And one of the things he always taught us is people always see the see what you look like and judge you by what you look like or what you're doing before they judge you as far as what you say and everything. So it's usually make sure you're presentable. Uh, a funny story about him is his presentable was actually back in the day in order to get it. He, I don't know that he did this, but he always joked around that he would take his uh, oldest uh, shirt and oldest pants to go in and ask for a pay raise to make it look like he didn't have enough money to have <laughs> a pay raise. So, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the having it presentable, I think having something that's neat and, and clean and easy to read is very, very uh, big as far as having that standard work out there and having it to help the people understand it. Because if it's sloppy, sometimes they're not even going to understand it just because it's, it's all over the place. Yeah. Go ahead, Shelly. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting because I, as a communicator, I think we often, um, especially when we have employees working for us, sometimes we think, why can't they just get it? Like, what don't they understand, right? But there are so many different types of learners and people learn different ways. And so when you can, when you can marry that, that visual with something that's written, it just be, becomes a, such a, um, a much more engaging piece of content that someone can actually get their brain around. So I think it, it makes perfect sense that you're thinking about those visual elements as well. And then, you know, you certainly layer in a good leader who can communicate well, and that just yeah. can take a team to the next level pretty easily. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the key is just being able to, to make that communication. And a lot of the, and you probably, a lot of places you go into, a lot of people talk about communication, communication it, it, coming from the factory floor. It's always communication sucks here. And it, it, it's wow. one of those things where you want to have that communication where everybody's talking to each other. And a lot of times people aren't talking to each other. They're usually talking across to each other, and not opening up those lines of communication to help each other out. So Jason, the environment that you're talking about, I think is the one that we is in lean are always aspiring for, which is that you have this mostly self-directed team, right? That is yeah. essentially taking care of each other and taking care of each other's work, helping each other out when there's a problem, helping each other solve the problem, being comfortable raising problems. Um, yeah. and, and, and the standard work is a piece of that because if you, if you know what the standard work is, then you know when there's a problem because the problem is when you, you know, are not able to achieve the standard work, right? Yeah. So Shelly, what is it that a leader can be doing in that kind of environment to, to it was so almost with their non-verbal behaviors to allow people to start to feel comfortable sharing and supporting each other? Yeah, so there's a lot that can happen. So first of all, just having open body language. So we trust people more when they're open and actually when they talk with their hands. So, um, 
years ago, I went in for an interview at Merck and I didn't know anything about the hand thing. And I was so nervous that I sat on my hands the whole time because I saw the woman, I saw the interviewer across the table, look at my hands when I was talking with them. So I put them under my seat the whole time and then didn't move them again. And that's really um, unfortunate because we, we trust people when we can see their hands. And that likens back to caveman times, because if you saw somebody, you wanted to know whether they had a weapon in their hand or not. So you were looking for their hands. And even though we're not really doing that uh, consciously anymore, we do it subconsciously to see like, can I see them? Can I trust them? And so having that open body language, using your hands and just communicating in a way that feels authentic to you. I, you know, I tell people you can dial it up or you can dial it down. Some people are not um, really comfortable talking with their hands or motioning, but it is more interesting if you think about the people that you like to listen to on the news, like they have expressions on their face and they show emotion and all of those things are laddered in and it makes you want to listen to them. So if a leader can, can encompass some of those skills that can help to really bring them to the next level of their leadership. Yeah. Jason, when you're working with folks on the manufacturing floor, what's, what's the usual expectation in terms of, of sharing emotion of, you know, being sort of on the softer side of things? I think the, the, what I've learned over the years is just getting to know the people and getting to understand them outside of just what their job is, just kind of getting to understand uh, them on a personal level and not becoming so, so ingrained into their life that, that you're, you're going out to, to the bar after work at, at the end of the day, but to be able to just be able to communicate with them, have uh, likenesses. Like sometimes you might have the same uh, sports team or the same, uh, same books that you like to read i mean sometimes you find somebody and this is why this is the biggest reason i always love work with the people out on the floor sometimes a lot of times those people out on the floor are extremely smart people they just are in a circumstance that they had to take a job at a factory they might have uh, had a, a kid at an early age they might have to support a family they they they're uh uh, parents might be in the hospital so they had to go take a job that they they had to be able to do it and that's what they're usually out on the floor for and that's that's the biggest thing as far as just getting to know your employees and getting to understand what the what makes them tick and and what uh, helps them out because it not gonna lie the the biggest melting pot i think is actually on a factory floor or out on your your main floor within a call center or something just because there's so many people that has so many different personalities and, and likeness or likes and dislikes. And it's just one of those places you just want to get to know the people as far as getting out there. That's really interesting. You know, when I'm thinking about you know, people who, like you said, people working in a call center, people working on the factory floor, you know, we have so much conversation now about, you know, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And a lot of times I think, you know, we're thinking about that sort of in the executive ranks, you know, and, yeah. and certainly, the, you know, the massive problems, you know, the higher you get in an organization, the less diversity you see. But you're right, Jason, the diversity is usually there um, at the, you know, at the place where the people are doing the real work. So, Shelley, what does that mean then when you're, when you're moving in this probably a culturally diverse environment? And it's very interesting what you said about, about hands. Um, I talk nice. a lot with my hands, so that makes me feel a lot better. And uh, you know that that's that's sort of an innate human um, characteristic that's probably independent of um, the culture you're raised in. But are there cultural um, differences that you know that your body language, language, or the way you present yourself or speak that that we might want to be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's many cultural differences and you can, you can see it, um, at, you know, across different cultures, certain cultures talk with their hands more, talk with their yeah. hands less, don't look at you when, when you talk. So just being aware of that and certainly not pushing anybody um, to do something that they're not comfortable with that doesn't feel right. But I also tell people that um, there's a part of body language that is learned, but it is a learned skill as well. So if you're, if you're someone who, um, you know, always crosses their arms when they communicate, 
it, you can unlearn that behavior and just start in little ways changing that. So maybe it's when you're at home with your family. So it doesn't feel so weird. And you just try to kind of open up a little bit, but you're going to get start to get received a little better. And you're actually going to have an easier time connecting with people if you put out those behaviors that that kind of pull them in because we, we all want to work with people we like, right? <laughs> like, you want to work with people you get along with, even if there's diversity and diversity of thought, and they have different opinions you at least want to be able to have a reasonable conversation about that. And, and so if you can portray those kind of open body language characteristics, it, it'll make that much easier to build that rapport with your employees or with your boss. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and going off of what you're saying is uh, sometimes I, I have a, a, a problem with it, but I don't know if it's because of my face naturally I don't smile all the time I do have a smile but it's not one of those ones that it's always on my face but I, I remember talking with one of the guys that I was uh, working with here recently and he was asking the about everybody he feels like everybody that hates him in a sense and he was their supervisor and he just he's naturally got that look on his face that's kind of gruff so people yeah. are scared of him, basically. They think he's mad all the time. So it's one of those things that then I told him, sometimes you just got to start talking to him. Because I think that's one thing that I've realized, because like I said, I don't always smile. And sometimes people think I'm just gruff. And, and I'm not, I wasn't talking about myself a second ago. I was talking about a different person. But they, they think I'm gruff. So that's how I just got to communicate with them and talking to people. So they don't always think that I'm, I'm gruff. I, I actually go up and I just start speaking with them and getting their trust and everything. Yeah. And some people just naturally have a face that's a little bit more crabby looking yeah. and it's just kind of resting. They call it like, I won't say it on air, yeah. but they call it like resting. Um, I yeah, we know. Crab. Yeah. You know, so um, when people are really concerned about that, if, it, if that's them, then I tell them to practice a little bit and just try to bring your, your face up a little bit more, um, yeah. more smiling, you know, whatever you can do or to call it out as such and say, you know, I've worked for people in the past who know that that's how they look. And they just say, listen, I know I look like I'm angry with you right now I'm not angry this is just how my face is <laughs> and yes. and then you get used to that as a you know that you have a leader like that yes yeah it, yeah exactly just like I said you got to communicate and build that trust and like you said tell them hey I'm not mad at you I just mm -hmm. sometimes I'm not naturally smiling or you might be thinking of something at the same time you're you're talking to that person and that's right something that I, I've had to teach myself is pull myself away from thinking about that and be present in that situation as far as being able to communicate with people throughout uh, throughout life and at, at work. That's really important, Jason. And I, and I think that's something that, that um, many of us, I know I have to work on, um, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's not just about, are you preparing your next question, right? It's, yeah. Uh, get ready to share your own story, which is what I just did. But it, but it's about are you truly, really, really listening and yeah. really, really paying attention. And that's really why I went into lean was to try to learn those those whole steps because I always tell people not only just with standard work, it gives you a tool set to be able to teach people so you can get to a standard, but also be creative. Uh, I, I know there's uh people that talk about when you eliminate chaos from the workplace, at their, not just the workplace, but from life in general, you're actually more creative than you are if you have chaos within your life. It, it just becomes easier to think about uh, newer things and, and uh, put those uh, thoughts into place. Yeah, well, it's, it's difficult to, to be creative. It's difficult to think divergently when mm -hmm. you are reacting. And when you, you when your body is on the defensive, so you, yeah. so you you need to get yourself in a place of being open and, and you know a, a little a little trouble will can drive creativity. But but if you are certainly in that place where you you are reactive and your body is reacting and and the adrenaline's rushing, uh, your brain is not particularly capable of of doing the the di divergent thinking, which which is what you need yeah. to get creativity started. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's the, 
just to kind of get rid of those things that happen, but you want it, like I said, you want a standard work to have some base that you come back to that, that way it's easier to think of the things that the firefighting, as we call it, it's easier to think of how to solve those problems. If you have something you come back to a base to come back to. Shelly, you talk a lot about people being authentic. And I'm thinking about, again, Jason, you have this style, which I think is absolutely perfect for the manufacturing floor, right? I mean, you are, you are a manufacturing guy, and I think you probably work it, walk in there. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you walk in looking gruff, you know, people are going, yeah, yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's kind of one of us. Um, and so it's, it's okay to be the way yeah. you are. Um, Shelly, what does it take for people to really find their own authenticity and maybe stop worrying about what they should do? Yeah, so it, it you know, it just takes kind of div digging deep and, and figuring out exactly what you want and how you can unlock that. And I, we so often get in situations where we freeze, like you were talking about earlier, and you know, you close up your body language and you're not, that might not be you, that's you reacting to a situation, right? Either stress or, or something. I used to take 95, which is a busy, busy road here in Philly into work in the morning. And, you know, I'd be like white knuckling at the whole drive and get into work and be so stressed out and, you know, jump into a meeting and you bring that into your meeting. So you want to be careful about that. So the first thing to do to kind of unlock that authenticity is just to really be in the moment. Um, I tell my clients, like, before you go into the room, take a deep breath, even if it means you're going to be an extra minute um, late, just take a deep breath, calm yourself down and put those things away. And just remember that, you know, it, you can be the brightest person in the world, but if you can't communicate it effectively, no one is going to know that. So you have to really try to own who you are and what you bring um, in that engagement. And so, you know, being your authentic self, but then also, you know, tweaking it to make yourself more successful. So learning the right communication skills that you need to be able to communicate who you are. Yeah, I like that. I, it's funny that you said that the taking a deep breath, I just, uh, I've been reading the, the book, um, think and grow rich and he mm -hmm. talks about in there where some of the guys actually would close their eyes just before they would make a decision just so they kind of when they close their eyes they're visualizing and everything right. basically closed out uh one of my favorite movies of the past was uh the perfect game i think that's what it's called with kevin costner where oh, yeah. before every pitch he would he would say the same uh, close the mechanism where the crowd would drown out and everything just disappeared. So it was kind of in that moment as far as being able to speak and everything. So, yeah, I, I like that. And I like the, the whole white knuckling here in Phoenix. That, that's one thing that's been nice during this pandemic is no traffic. Well, not right. no traffic, but less traffic. Yes. Yeah. White knuckling is not fun. <laughs> no, it's not. It gets you all worked up, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually, uh, for a while, I was uh, working in the city also, Shelly, and I had to take the Schuylkill Expressway, which was definitely yeah. white knuckle at, at, nice. at many times. And, you know, when you get to work, then you can kind of feel a little fired up or exhausted or, you know, uh, not not ready to get started. But I think there's another, there's another piece to commuting, right, which is when you are, when you actually have a commute, which a lot of people don't have at the moment, that can also be a time for mental preparation, mm. but you know, for listening for, to calming music, if it, you know, if the traffic's not too bad, enjoying the scenery, um, and has you know create some space. And I'm wondering now, as people are doing so much of what we're doing right now, which is you're on Zoom, right? You you walked from the kitchen to you know the space in your house, which is your which is your Zoom space, um, you know. Are you finding that people ha have less time? I mean, or more time? Uh, how is how is that affecting people? Is that move making that transition from home to who I am at work? So last week I, I had a meeting with somebody that I, I was speaking with that I think 
some people have less time. Some people have more time. It just all depends. Uh, I know when she was talking, she had used to be you, you scheduled in that travel time in between meetings. So you kind of had that, that buffer zone in between meetings where now she said that her schedule was basically booked from the time she got to work to the, the end of the day, because you really don't have to travel anywhere. So you're basically either in your office or at your home and you can schedule a zoom meeting back to back to back to back uh -huh. and not have any buffer in between where before you had that buffer. So I, I think people almost have less time as far as being at work, but more time as far as you're not driving between work. Right. Yeah. That's what I've seen too. I think people are actually working longer. <laughs> they're like, their days are like mixing into their nights and they're just working round the clock. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've been telling my clients is to still take that commute time. And so if at the start of the day or the end of the day to just get out and walk around the block and that's your commute for the day, just to like de-stress and put something between the end of the day and your, you know, your relaxing family time, if you can do it. But, you know, certainly people are working really hard um, these days. And I know that's what my, my wife actually just went back to work last week. We had a, a, a baby boy last, this past November. And I think that's what she's having difficulties with because of the Zoom calls, they're pretty much, their meetings go back to back to back to back. And she doesn't have that drive time where you can kind of de-stress. And even if you're in traffic, sometimes you can de-stress in that. She's got a weird thing where she does de-stress in traffic. I don't, I cannot stand driving on the freeway when it's packed. It's, I, I just <laughs> like knuckle on it, but her, she kind of, that's her time to kind of de-stress at yeah. that. So yeah. That's good yeah. advice though. I might yeah. give her that advice. Yeah, please do. <laughs> so I, so that's, you know what, again, you know, we're thinking about, so how do we communicate, right? And everything's changed in the past year and it's gonna change again um, as, oh, you know, hopefully we get the vaccines out there and, and we're able to get, you know, more people back into workspaces. Jason, you're gonna be traveling again soon. Yeah. Um, uh, at, but, maintaining or, or building that sense of who you are as an authentic leader, right? So that you can communicate what you want to communicate. You can create that environment, Jason, that, that you, that we want in a lean environment, that open environment that still is going to require that work to do. And I was wondering if, if each of you could, could sort of give me, um, uh, you know, a couple of your best tips for how do you, um, keep yourself centered to be that leader, even when everything else is going crazy around you. And, and Shelly, I'll, I'll let you go first. Yeah, so that's, that's a really good uh, question. I think one thing that you do is, is to take those, those moments and those deep breaths and that time for yourself so that you can stay centered and focusing on the work itself. So if you're going into a Zoom meeting, you know, making sure that you're really in that meeting to the extent that you can be. And I know that we all have other things happening, you know, as we're working from home, but, uh, but really being there. So having the screen on, having the camera on, I can't tell you how many meetings you go into and somebody turns the camera off right away. And I get it that sometimes you need a little bit of a, you know, break from that, but, but if you're there, then I can see you, then I can, I can hear you. I know what, I know that you're engaged with me. So I really feel like you're in the room with me. Um, so that's one thing. And then just being consistent as a leader. I think, you know, we all have our moments where things are a little bit chaotic, but to the extent that you can be consistent. So that means that you're consistent in your nonverbals as well as your communication. So you know, if you're telling people that everything's fine, but you've got your arms crossed and you're giving them a glare, then it's probably not fine. So just call it out as that, right? And just be consistent. Because when there, when there's consistency there, that's when people really start to kind of feel this um, uneasiness with the leader and what's happening. So you need to try to marry that consistency and that can help as well. Okay. 
yeah, I, yeah. You, consistency's a, a big key, regardless of whether you're a, a leader of a sports team or a leader of a, a manufacturing facility or a leader of a, a corporate office. You got to have that consistency. Um, it, it's one of those things that everybody wants a leader that they can understand and not have to walk on eggshells going into the office mm -hmm. uh, because they don't know what they're going to get from time to time. I, I think there's actually a joke about that as far as, or there was a, a, a sitcom that talked about it. Well, what's he like today before they entered the office? And if he was <laughs> upset, they didn't go in. If he was not upset, they went in type of thing. So that, that's more than likely my wife would be able to tell me, but it, <laughs> it, I believe there's a show that does that, that, that talks about that as far as somebody going into the office. It, as far as my communication and, and helping people out through communication, I, I like what Shelly says about being consistent. Uh, one of the things I learned through throughout the years, when I first started out in the manufacturing field, I worked in a, a foundry, which is hot. And, and sometimes when you get to moving fast in super extreme heat, your body gets to the point where your, your, your heart's going 90 miles an hour. So you got to kind of take that when people ask you questions, you just look at them and, and let them know, Hey, just give me one second so I can answer your question. And then we can go from there. And then just taking those breaks to get away from people. Yeah. You want to be able to help people out all the, a lot of the time, but you also need to take a break. Like Shelly said, uh, have time to yourself, uh, whether it's just kind of going outside, taking a break, calming down, getting away from everything, not having to think about it all the time. I, I believe I read a story yesterday or the day before that talked about uh, people that work on the front line or carpenters and stuff like that usually have it easier to de-stress than people that are constantly using their, their the knowledge workers. As far as knowledge workers are always thinking about stuff, so usually the de-stressing doesn't go away as fast as the people that aren't always thinking about the that end of the work as far as that goes that's really interesting yeah yeah that's uh wow um and here i go again to tell my own story so i remember um many years ago i was on a um a mission trip to honduras and we were working uh building helping to build houses and i got assigned to the cement block factory i know nothing about cement blocks but but my job was basically you know they would pour the cement into these molds and my job was when they were dry was taking them out of the molds um and once you learn how to do it it was pretty easy and i found it to be the most relaxing work i had <laughs> ever done right yeah. it was it was great you know compared to a lot of the work which i do which is you know pretty much you know what what are you thinking about and 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 how are you how are you you know changing a process something like that and it, you know there are a lot of things to think about which is kind of wake you up at two o'clock in the morning kind of stuff you know if, it, yeah. if it's not if it's yeah. not going well and you can ruminate on it i know i don't think you know taking the molds off a concrete block that you would ever wake up in the middle of the night worrying about that yeah, so, yeah that's that that's that's uh, that's interesting you know to think about how, yeah, how do we get that more of that in our lives of, of not you know just things that are that um that we're, that's we're, uh, go ahead big, jason and that's my biggest worry with the whole zoom thing like you, you was talking shelly and i i was saying earlier sometimes i think with Zoom, everybody's at work. I, I know I've talked to people that sometimes they actually take vacation away from their area, but they're still working, especially right now with the, the whole Zoom because you can go pretty much anywhere and be connected as far as that goes. So it's one of those things that I think that's my biggest worry with Zoom is everybody's gonna be at work and it's you're constantly gonna be working. I, I should say you're not really enjoying being with your family or being in that moment and everything. Yeah, and the funny thing about Zoom is that you are, you know, we are very close here mm -hmm. sitting. So from a nonverbal perspective, you would never, we would never sit across the table looking at each other this closely <laughs> yes. in a meeting. Um, and so it's really intimate. It, in some ways, it's a very intimate engagement, more mm -hmm. so than it would be in the uh, in the um, office. So the the 
benefit of that though is that I think when we do get back to the office people are actually going to feel a little bit more connected because yeah. not only have you been on zoom close but you've also been through this this bonding moment together yeah. so hopefully it brings some teams together yeah it, it, it helps them yes yeah to be able to communicate because they've had to adjust their communication style absolutely I, I know uh, people that are training people that just got hired on as far as I, I know a couple of people that just got hired on like in March and in March, everything shut down and they're still trying to learn their job as far as that goes. And usually you were able to go grab somebody to give you a hand and show you what was going on where now it's sometimes the communication has to get to the point where it's better across zoom as far as there's nobody there to help and you got to depend on yourself but right. also you have to depend on the person that's training you to communicate that to you as far as that goes and sometimes through zoom it's not as easy to communicate save the work harder yes. yeah <laughs> yeah wow so maybe when we all get back into our offices and plants would be a, have a whole bunch of people who actually are Closer, as you said, Shelly and Babs have learned some new communication skills mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, It'd be interesting to see what 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 happens as as we move forward. It is going to be interesting, <laughs> Shelly. I'm so interested in what you you know what you say about you know the nonverbals and how you sort of present yourself, and it's not so much about necessarily about what you're wearing but you know right. how you present yourself and and whether you look open or whether you know whether people feel that you are interested in them, things like that. And Jason, thinking about where we started with this idea of, you know, things like um, standard work documentation, uh, visual management boards, it seems to me that there's some kind of, a, of an equivalent there, right? That you can have these things, these artifacts that help us um, communicate even when you know if we're not there you know saying you know you move, move this thing three degrees you know or you know whatever the you know whatever the instruction is um and in a way there's sort of non-verbals with those too right with yes. whether they're readable the you know the colors that you use mm. what are the ways that we could make them you know friendlier and 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 more um more open I would say the, the biggest thing to, to help make them more friendly and more open as far as having your standard work is, is talking with the person at the job as, as far as communicating with them to see what their thoughts are as far as the process. I know a lot of times your standard work are usually going to be cookie cutter across all the jobs. So bring everybody together within that facility so they understand what you're doing how you're doing it and also communicate how they would like to, to visually see it and get a, a consensus as far as what they, they would like to see, what makes it easiest for everybody to read. And that's one of the biggest things with standard work is having that consensus as far as what makes it easy for everybody to understand. Uh, you don't want to have six different people doing six different things on the same job. You want to make sure everybody's pretty much following the same standard work that way you can create that uh, creativity as far as eliminating that chaos and, and people can find new ways and better ways to, to uh, improve their job or, or solve problems that they're having every day as far as that goes. But yeah, just to have something that is very uh, standard, uh, that, as I should say, uh, just a standard to set across the, all facilities that are all uh, workspaces and, and making sure everybody understands what it is and how to read it and make sure you're updating it when there are changes being made. Right. Uh, that, that's really important. I mean, I mean, certainly that's a, that, that's always a challenge with any type of documentation because as soon as, as uh, life changes and as it does, people start yeah. doing things in a different way. And then what it says on the document and what they're doing is different and then they start to ignore the document even more but yeah. it sounds like what you're saying is is it can be more friendly in a way if it was created by friends right so if people yeah. if people worked on it together and they own it as opposed to it you know here's your standard work and you know you all just follow it which is kind of more the you know the old way of doing sop standard operating yeah. procedures That's, yeah. that was the way that it used to be so it's a sense it's 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 a you know a shared 
a shared, yeah, uh, a shared document. It's just like everything within within most facilities. You want everybody to share the jobs and not. How do I say it? Another reason I, I always like lean is because usually everything is but is brought out to be a win win situation. It's not the win lose. You got to do it this way. You got to do it this way. It's more of a win win situation where you have to come to that compromise. And I, not just in in everyday life. I think that's a lot of what's going on in our world right now is nobody compromises with each other. So there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't get done because everybody wants to win and there's a winner and a loser. Now, is there always going to be a win win situation? No, but usually within that lean you want a win-win situation and with standard work when you compromise and everybody comes together usually you're doing a win-win situation to where everybody understands sometimes you got to make a sacrifice and not do it this way but at least everybody agrees on a certain certain way of doing things yeah especially if it's focused on on this work is going to deliver something that is for our customers right it's not it's not just for us yes exactly yeah, yeah. All right, so um, let's. I just would like to hear from each of you your one piece of advice for a young person just starting out in their career. So, Jason, you want to go first, and Shelley will let you wrap up. Um, the one piece of advice is just to, well, I've got a couple. Of, sorry, <laughs> uh, but my biggest one is read. I know when I was younger, probably in my early twenties and thirties reading, working in a factory and everything, it, and, and coming from where I come from, reading was a faux pas for, for men or boys at that, at that time, just mm. because you always thought you knew everything, you thought you was tougher than the world, so you didn't read, and my biggest advice is, is to read, I mean, over the, probably the past five, four or five years, I've probably read at least 30 or 40 books a year. So it's one of those things I, I've learned a lot over the last three or four years, just from, from reading and, and grabbing good books and, and getting to understand more than just what I thought I always knew type of things. And then always try to find somebody within your, your, uh, your uh, field to mentor you, to, to, to go to, to get advice from, uh, just to, help you with any problems that you might not be able to solve they might be able to have an answer for you or they might use it as they they talk about the lean have be a sensei as far as teaching you through doing the the problem and kind of guiding you to that answer wow great advice shelly yeah that's hard to follow <laughs> so um i you know my advice would be similar in that just being curious and trying to learn your whole life. Um, you know, I think the older you get, the more you realize you don't know things. And so you're mm -hmm. constantly, you know, if you can be curious and constantly try to learn, um, that just sets you up to have an interesting career and be open to the twists and turns that happen in your career and be willing to say yes. And I think, you know, one of my biggest pieces of, of advice is, is that if someone you know, tells you, you can't do something. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just typically means you can't do it with them. So yeah. think about how you get there and, and who you bring on board for your journey in your career. Well, that's great advice too. Yeah, Shelly well, O'Donovan, where can people find you? So they can find me at theauthenticinfluencegroup.com and you can find me on LinkedIn too, Shelly O'Donovan. Uh, and that those are probably the best places to find me. Great. Thanks. Jason, how about you? You can find me on LinkedIn at, at Jason Haynes, uh, spelled H-A-I-N-E-S. I, yeah. I always have to, to explain that because there's, I think, three or four different d d names of the Haynes's. Uh, a, a long story short, our family had feuds back through the day, and that's how our names changed. Uh, <laughs> uh, or you can find us at, at isiworld.net, uh, where our company uh, is, uh, started out at Tulsa, Oklahoma. Great. All right. So we have covered a lot of ground here with, uh, with written and verbal and nonverbal communication and quite a few stops in between. So I want to thank you both for traveling with me to the edges of Lean. And thank you, too. Thank you so much. It's been fun. <laughs> Thanks. This is Bella Ankelbeck, and I'd like to thank Shelley O'Donovan and Jason Haynes for being my guests on the edges of Lean. How are you communicating? 
Shelly, Jason, and I would love to hear back from you on your thoughts and ideas. Find us on LinkedIn. Please join me in exploring more of the edges of Lean. There's a lot to learn. And check out my friends in the Lean Communicators community at leancommunicators.com. You'll find more podcasts and videos with lots of great new content every week. The Edges of Lean is written and produced by Bella Engelbike. This is a Lean for Humans production.